the biggest earthquake in Japan's recorded history sent a series of massive tsunamis hurtling towards the coast. The waves would strike with unstoppable force, crushing almost everything in their path, sweeping away entire communities and thundering as deep as 10 kilometres inland. But this was just the beginning of a triple-headed disaster. People have forgotten or think in a way that the accident is over. To a certain extent, it's not over. It's still ongoing. I'm back to investigate this ongoing drama, going into the very heart of the nuclear fallout zone, more than five years since the meltdowns. I'm just metres away from the main reactor buildings here at the Fukushima nuclear plant. This area is high exposure. Very high exposure? Yeah. yeah. We can't stay here. And we talked to people forced to confront Japan's biggest crisis since the Second World War. You were the Prime Minister of Japan at the time. How close did this country come to all-out disaster? This is a journey that began almost a year before the earthquake and tsunami struck. And it started among the cherry blossoms and shrines in the coastal town of Rikazen Takada in northeast Japan. Rikazen Takada is an old whaling port. And as the ABC's Tokyo correspondent, I'd come to do a story about Japan's controversial whaling program. The night before I returned to Tokyo, I was invited to dinner with some of the locals. Among them, fisherman Yoshiharu Yoshida. Not surprisingly, I left Rikazen Takata the next day with a sore head never expecting to be back. Little did I know that I would return, but that when I did, some of my dinner companions would be dead. The 11th of March, 2011. I was in Kyushu, a thousand kilometres south of Tokyo. To ensure the way of the sword I'd come to do a story about one of Japan's last master sword makers. At 2.46 p.m., as I was filming slashing swords and dress-up samurai, my wife Susie was at home in Tokyo with our youngest daughter when she felt a tremor. I felt the earthquake start and it just didn't feel like any other earthquake and so I, I grabbed her straight away and took her under the table. It intensified quite quickly. Far to the south in Kyushu, I didn't feel a thing. But within minutes, it was all over the news. This is the moment Japan was rocked. It was hit by tremors at around 2.46 p.m. The full extent of the damage is still not known. And something is burning. A tsunami warning was issued. The earthquake had spawned a massive tsunami, which was barreling towards Japan's northeast coast. In Tokyo, my wife had emerged from under our dining room table and was scrambling to pick up our two daughters from their school. And on the way there was uh, a very big aftershock which was really scary as well. I was already shaking from the first one still and so I couldn't, I actually couldn't drive the car. I had to pull over in the middle of the road and just wait for that to finish. It just felt like it was the end of the world. There was just this sense that Something really bad was happening and, it, and it, was, it was very scary and quite unbelievable.
As I began the journey to rejoin my family in Tokyo, entire towns were being destroyed and thousands of people were being consumed by the rising walls of water. I would soon learn that Rikazen Takara was one of the many communities wiped off the map. We flew into the disaster zone. What we saw was buses and ships on top of buildings, and we saw mountains and mountains of debris. And even if you're Japanese or not Japanese, it was just hard to believe. It's very tense at the time. The full extent of the damage and the disaster is being revealed. Just days later, we were in the heart of the tsunami zone, 500 kilometers north of Tokyo. It was bone chillingly cold and roads were cut. Electricity, water, communications, everything was down. This is the main street of Kamaishi, or what's basically left of it. As you can see, shops, businesses have all been destroyed, cars have been pulverised against each other and just left here by a 10 metre wave. I was headed back to Rikazen Takara, but to get there we had to make our way through one obliterated town after another. This is Ofunato, a fishing town of about 40,000 people in Iwate Prefecture. And when the tsunami smashed into this place, it was 10 metres high and travelling at 60 kilometres an hour. It came in from behind me and as you can see, it just destroyed everything in its path. Houses, cars, people's lives. We, we'll take a look over here. I'll just pop under these power lines. They're not live. Oh. As you can see, if we, we swing around, there are cars propped up over here. There's a house that's been pushed down this channel hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of metres. A tsunami more than 400 kilometres long had slammed into Japan's northeast coast, flattening dozens of communities. With communications down and thousands of people missing, this is now the only effective way to communicate. This is a message board outside the evacuation centre. It contains the names and details of everyone who's staying here. After several days, we finally made it to Rikazen Takara. There, we were confronted by a scene reminiscent of an atomized Hiroshima or Nagasaki. The restaurant I'd enjoyed dinner at nearly a year before was gone, and its owners swept to their deaths. One of the only people we could find was the fisherman Yoshiharu Yoshida, who recounted an incredible tale of survival. Like this Japan Coast Guard boat, Yoshida headed for open ocean, teetering and falling over the growing wave. He would then turn to watch as Rikazen Takara was smashed to pieces. Finally made it back, Yoshida had to remove bodies from the little cove in front of his home, which had been just out of reach of the tsunami. But further down the coast, 15 metre waves had breached the seawalls protecting the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. 
swamping generators and knocking out cooling to the reactors. As I was making my way to Rikazentakada, the country's Prime Minister was grappling with the biggest nuclear disaster since Chernobyl 25 years earlier. In Washington, President Barack Obama's nuclear chief was struggling to get information about the developing disaster. We knew that they had lost power, we knew that their water supplies were, were limited, um, and obviously without power you really can't do much in a nuclear power plant to, um, to keep the reactors cool. So, you know, there was a lot of missing information and there was just a lot of um, limited information really about what was going on at the time. Declassified US government emails detail that information vacuum though one forwarded from a Japan source to the then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton as Fukushima's reactors were melting down, reveals the panic at official levels. <laughs> 240 kilometres away from the melting reactors, Tokyo is the world's most populated metropolis its political and business leaders had long championed nuclear power. Japan is the world's third largest energy user, while Tokyo consumes more energy than some first world nations. And the company with the monopoly over power supply into the world's biggest metropolis is none other than TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company. To many Japanese, TEPCO is the evil empire a giant corporation that put profit before safety at Fukushima. Even the Prime Minister was struggling to get information from the company about what was happening inside the stricken plant. Desperate, Nato Khan turned to his nuclear chief for advice. What he was told was unthinkable. <laughs> You really can't evacuate a city like Tokyo. You would have had a populace that probably would have expected to be able to evacuate and simply not possible in a short period of time to move all the people that live in Tokyo outside of the city. The order to abandon Tokyo would never be issued. Instead, hundreds of thousands of Fukushima residents were told to evacuate. But more than five years after the meltdowns, Fukushima and its nuclear refugees are a fading memory. So I'm heading back to a place I've reported from more than 20 times. To see if the nuclear plant is under control, to find out what's happened to the people who were forced to flee the fallout and to check on the decontamination of the 700 square kilometer evacuation area. In many places in the so-called nuclear no-go zone, time has stood still for the past five years. Homes, shops and schools untouched by everything except radiation and decay. Many communities high in the mountains and tucked away in the valleys may never be able to be decontaminated. Hamlets like this, where the radiation remains extremely high. Here, many people may never be able to return. Instead, they'll have to start new lives in other parts of Japan. Most of the people who are willing to return are maybe in their 60s or 70s. Younger people, for the most part, if they have any opportunity to leave, they have. Some of the surveys have shown that only 7 to maybe 15 percent of the people want to return. And the question is, what do they have to return to? Few places symbolize both the natural and nuclear disasters of 2011 more 
than the Ukedo Primary School. Here, the tsunami ripped through the bottom floor, while the top story remained untouched, except by the radioactive fallout. The 80 children of this school survived the waves, but they've never been back. Once a place of laughter and learning, this school now stands as a silent monument to the costliest natural disaster in human history. One man has refused all requests to leave. Nato Matsumura lives just a few kilometres from the melted Fukushima reactors. He's been described as the most contaminated person in Japan. Matsumura wanders freely through the ghost town of Tomioka, once home to 16,000 people. The empty streets, the abandoned shops, the train station to nowhere, None of it bothers him, neither does the fact that nature is slowly reclaiming what humans have left behind. Nato Matsumura refuses to leave the fallout zone for one simple reason, his animals. もう本当にバカすぎるって。で、みんなもう2、3日したらまだ戻られるっていうわけで、もうペット犬猫とか家畜全部全て置いてたわけよ。俺が3日後にそれを見た時に、いや、これ全部が集まって、もうそっからもう
of thousands never want to return, the nuclear no-go zone is attracting a new type of visitor, the disaster tourist. This group is from Nagoya, more than 400 kilometres to the southwest. あの、テレビとか これ見て本当に原発が必要なのかなっていうふうに思いますよね。かわいそうですけどね。戻ってこれないよね。こんなに来たりのかっていう顔をされてましたからね。どうしてあの何年経ってもねこのままなのってのは皆さん質問されますけ
The silence is particularly haunting for Azuma Hashimoto, because for years he was in charge of disaster prevention at both of Fukushima's nuclear plants. Now a byword for nuclear nightmare, Fukushima remains a spectacular place of soaring mountains, verdant forest, lush fields and meandering streams. 0.6. But the screeching of a Geiger counter quickly reminds you of the fallout that has settled over this landscape. Well, we're a few kilometres into the no-go zone here near the village of Namie. And the higher you climb up into the mountains, the higher the reading on the Geiger counter. So it would suggest that uh, a lot of radiation is still in the mountains in areas that are very, very difficult to clean up. I'm on my way to see a couple who've only just been allowed back into their home after more than five years. They now face one monster of a clean-up. <laughs> Helping Hideo and Ryoko Nishi sort through what's left of their weather-beaten and decaying possessions is a small army of workers from TEPCO, the company responsible for the Fukushima nuclear plant. For the Nishis, there's little to salvage, because after five years their home has been contaminated by radiation and rodents. While most of their possessions are so damaged and decayed they have to be thrown out, Mrs Nishi has found one precious item she's determined to keep. Carved by her late father, it's a statue of Ebisu the Japanese god of fortune. The Nishi's house is only a few kilometres from the nuclear plant, where every day thousands of workers are bussed in to continue the clean-up work and to prepare for the most complex nuclear retrieval effort in history, the removal of highly radioactive melted fuel from the bowels of this plant. Has anything like this ever been attempted before? <laughs> Noahiro Masada is regarded as a hero by many in Japan for saving the second Fukushima nuclear plant known as Daini from meltdown. He and his team managed to rig up a makeshift power system to keep the reactors cool and to save the day. Masada's reward for his heroism? Arguably the most difficult job in Japan, making the shattered Fukushima Daiichi plant safe.
To show us how this work is going, Mr Masseter has invited me to spend a day touring the sprawling facility. To go right up to the reactor buildings housing the melted nuclear cores and into the nerve centre where everything is controlled. This is a very important room in the history of the Fukushima meltdowns and the disaster itself because this is where the so-called Fukushima 50 bunkered down during the crisis, the worst of the meltdowns when the radiation was spiking and some feared it would go out of control. Now it's the centre for the decommissioning process, which as we know is going to take decades. For our initial foray into the plant, we are kitted out in light protection gear. And our first stop is a reminder of the colossal task facing TEPCO, dealing with contaminated water. So this is the tank area. So here we've got over a thousand tanks on this site. TEPCO is removing about 62 nuclear substances from the water. The only one they can't remove is tritium. But so far they're taking at least 62 elements out but still, there's about a thousand tanks on site that they've got to deal with. Tritium goes directly into the soft tissues and organs of the human body, potentially increasing the risk of cancer. The site has nearly reached its capacity, with more than half a million tonnes of contaminated water, much of it pumped in to keep the melted reactor fuel from heating up again. <laughs> But on top of that, every day 150 tonnes of groundwater flows into the plant, and some believe this poses the biggest threat of all. What concerns me is the volume of water um, that exists at the site. This water contamination problem is not under control, and it's not really controllable. There really isn't any way to stop it. Particle physicist Gregory Yotsko was the chairman of the United States Atomic Watchdog when Fukushima melted down. He coordinated US help as the disaster unfolded. He warns that the task of keeping three melted reactors stable and then cleaning them up will take decades. It's a very, very difficult situation. There is no simple solution. There is no silver bullet that is going to put a stop to everything and, and, and make this just go away overnight. But many Japanese simply don't trust TEPCO with the decommissioning of the site. The past few years have been marked by company cover-ups, incompetence and near misses. Like the time a single rat gnawed through a cable, shutting down power to a pool cooling thousands of nuclear fuel assemblies. Then there was TEPCO's mea culpa in June this year the company confessing that it concealed the meltdowns at Fukushima for months after the disaster. It is natural for the public to interpret the decision as a cover-up. We deeply apologise. The moral and ethical responsibility that they have really avoided up to this time. That's what is really scandalous in this. But TEPCO says it's getting on with the job, building new machines and infrastructure to deal with a myriad of problems, like the millions of contaminated protection suits used by the workers on site. There's a backlog of work gear big enough to fill 28 Olympic swimming pools, so the company has built an incinerator several storeys high. The heat here is really intense, as you'd imagine, because this is the incinerator, the furnace, where they're burning all this irradiated protective gear. Now, every day, 6,500 workers are on this site, and sometimes they have multiple changes of clothing. So there's a lot of gear to burn, because a lot of it is unsafe. It's irradiated. Those six and a half thousand workers come from all over Japan. Their radiation exposure is closely monitored. But last year, the allowable level was more than doubled. The country's nuclear watchdog said the step was vital so that workers could stay on site longer in a bid to keep the crisis at Fukushima containable. 
ていくかその中で仕事をいかに進めていくかこれをバランスを取りながら仕事をやるっていうのが非常に大きなあのチャレンジだと思ってます一番難しい問題だと思っております。We've spent several hours around the plant already, but we're going closer to the reactor buildings now, which means we've got to put on more heavy duty protective gear. For this part of our tour, we are accompanied by five minders because we are heading to the buildings housing the melted reactors. And there are restrictions. What? TEPCO is worried about possible nuclear terrorism and won't allow us to film certain security sites. Reactor one, reactor two, reactor three with all the rubble over there. The radiation spikes the closer we go to the reactors, where deep inside lies the melted nuclear fuel. And TEPCO's greatest challenge. According to decommissioning chief Naohiro Masada. The roadmap is that in 2021, the first nuclear fuel production will be stopped in Tokyo. So, the target is to target the target for 2021. I'm just meters away from the main reactor buildings here at the Fukushima nuclear plant. Behind me, reactor 3. Now, we've seen what happens there. There was a hydrogen reactor that exploded there. Behind me, reactor 3. Now, we've seen what happens there. There was a hydrogen explosion right after the nuclear fuel melted. Next to it, reactor 2. It's still a problem today. There was no hydrogen explosion, but what happened inside there, no one really knows because the radiation is so high. No one to this day has been able to get inside. And there is reactor one, and it could present particular problems for TEPCO because that is where probably the worst meltdown occurred. They don't know where the nuclear fuel is, and it could take TEPCO several years to even work that out. もう実際にデブリ燃料がどこに投票しているかはまだ見たことがありませんので、なるべく早くやはり見るというのは大事だと思います。During our interview, Naohiro Masada reveals for the first time just how vast the amount of melted fuel is, the three molten blobs that lie somewhere deep within each of these buildings. 一つのプラント大体200トンぐらいずつのものがあると思いますので、ほぼほぼ600トンぐらいのその投票した燃料とそのコンクリートとか金属が混ざったものがあると。そういった意味で、これは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、私たちは、Immediately, the radiation level begins to rise. What's happening? Okay, so we're just between reactor four and reactor three, but the radiation level has gone up to, an, to, to a point where our TEPCO guides are not comfortable going any further. So we'll head back. After a day inside the nuclear plant, it is time to strip off our gear. And submit to routine testing. It's a process that the workers here go through every day, and it's a reminder of the decades-long task ahead of TEPCO. あのまあこれはですね東京電力だけでできるようなあのものだとは思っていません。我々今その世界中のエキスパートの方々に一緒にこう見てもらって仕事のやり方をチェックしてもらったり。一緒にこう判断をしてもらったりしてますし。現時点で政府があの東電にまあいわばこう支援で出しているお金が6兆円です。しかしそれだけでは全く足りません。多分20兆円以上の費用がかかると思われます。
But for countless others, the cost of the natural and nuclear disasters can never be measured in dollar terms. Their lives and families were torn apart on March 11. The story of Norio Kimura is one of the most tragic to come out of the disaster. He lost three generations of his family to the tsunami. His father, his wife, and his youngest daughter, Yuna. The seven-year-old is the only person still listed as missing from their hometown of Okuma, just north of the nuclear plant. I got to know Norio Kimura well over the years. I would visit him and his surviving daughter Mayu after they'd escaped the fallout of Fukushima. Here in their new home high in the Japanese Alps, the two of them would try to start a new life together. But Kimura would keep going back to the no-go zone to search for any trace of little Yuna. Yet again, he's returned to search in the no-go zone. But because of the radiation, Kimura and his volunteers are only allowed in for five hours at a time. As they pick through piles of rotting debris, Kimura is approached by some police who ask us not to film them or what they have found. After a few minutes, he returns with a bag. It contains some family photos the police have found in the piles of debris. And for Kimura, something else far more precious. So how do you feel when you, you see Yuna's uh, shirt like this? あの、本当にこう、ね、ユーナはね、あの、いるわけではないけど、彼女と彼女がここにいた証でもあるし、それを感じられるっていうのは本当にあの、まあね、あの、今の自分にとっては最大の喜びっていうか、幸せな瞬
Less than a week after the disaster, I met Keitaro Fukuda. His daughter Risa and son Masayaki were swept away by a wave three stories high. They, along with 72 other students from the Okawa Primary School, died that day because the teachers dithered on the school oval and didn't heed warnings about the approaching tsunami. The bodies of Risa and Masaaki would be found in the early days of the search. For Naomi Haratska, the search for her daughter Koharu would go on for months, well after the official recovery teams had packed up and left. The devoted mother qualified for her mechanical digger's licence so she could continue to try to find the remains of her 12-year-old girl and those of other missing school children. Five months after the tsunami, Koharu's remains would be found. Six kilometres away from the school, floating in a bay on the Pacific coast. The tsunami claimed more than 18,000 lives and left countless families bereft. The survivors, they're struggling with their lives, still having a, a hard time. And some people even say that they wish they died in the tsunami with them because life is so hard. One man has managed to resume his normal life. <laughs> I've come back to Rikazen Takara to visit that great survivor, my friend, the fisherman Yoshiharu Yoshida. He'd ridden over the tsunami in his boat as it thundered towards his town. He shows me how high the biggest waves were when they hit the coast near his house. <laughs> This coastline was hit by tsunamis in 1933 and 1896, but nothing as big as 2011. Back then, I was greeted by scenes of devastation and death. No survivors are being pulled out of here, just and hundreds of bodies. Five years on, I'm back in this exact same spot. And in the end, one in every 10 of Rikazen Takata's residents would die in the tsunami. The debris is all gone now, replaced by five million cubic tonnes of earth, scraped off a nearby mountain and put in the city centre. That's in the hope that this community can be raised by up to 13 metres to protect itself from future tsunamis. This time authorities aren't just raising the town, but they're building towering seawalls, some more than five storeys high. They're part of a 400 kilometre chain of gigantic tsunami defences being built along the coast of northeast Japan. But fisherman Yoshiharu Yoshida scoffs at the idea that concrete walls can repel the raw power of a tsunami. 
せれないじゃないですかこ,この間のああいうの来たらもうまた同じことを繰り返しみたいな感じで別なあの町なんですけど堤防があのできてるやつ見るとなんでこんな高いの,高いのを作んなきゃなんないのとか全然海見えないんじゃない反対に怖いんじゃないかっていう人たちも今出てきました。Is living here, this part of Japan, is, a, is another tsunami inevitable given the tsunamis we've seen in the past? So, this is it. I think that's why I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. 地震、津波でもう頭に入ってからもう逃げなきゃっていうのは頭に入っていて。This history of disaster is ingrained in the Japanese people through historical art and literature, and through the ancient stones that mark the tsunamis that have scarred this coastline for millennia. But the earthquake of 2011 was so big, it continues to rattle fragile nerves more than five years since the massive seismic rupture. There have been tens of thousands of aftershocks since the big magnitude 9 earthquake. And I was living in Tokyo at the time and I felt dozens and dozens of those aftershocks, some bigger than magnitude 7. And here I am, five and a bit years later, back. And last night in my hotel room, there was yet another aftershock, a magnitude 5.8, which was literally just a couple of dozen kilometres off the coast from this abandoned village of Nemea. Now, it's not just up here that's experiencing earthquakes. We've had the big earthquake recently down south in Kyushu, where dozens died. It's just a fact of life for the Japanese. In November 2016, that fact of life was reinforced once again. An earthquake struck off Fukushima province about an hour ago. A tsunami warning was issued for much of Japan's northeastern coastline. Officials are urging residents on the coast to evacuate as soon as possible. Hundreds of thousands were evacuated after a large earthquake off the Fukushima coast. Luckily, this time, it turned out to be minor, with waves in the centimetres, not metres. My journey ends on a beach I first visited after the disasters. Then I went in with police in radiation protection gear to search this area for bodies left behind by the tsunami. Just down the shore, hidden behind this outcrop, is the Fukushima nuclear plant. Nuclear power once accounted for one third of Japan's energy output. But more than five years on from the Fukushima meltdowns, only a couple of the country's nuclear reactors are up and running. Some former supporters of atomic energy now believe the risks are just too great. And that includes those who had to tackle the nuclear disaster head on. つまり従来は本来コストにとして考えるべき事故の時の費用とかあるいはその使用済み燃料つまりは核廃棄物の処理の費用とかそういうものをコストにカウントしないことによって安い安いと言っていたんですが We have to acknowledge that nuclear power plant accidents and severe accidents like this can happen and in fact that they probably will happen somewhere in the world again And here Along this lonely stretch of coast, a nuclear drama continues to play out and will do for decades to come.